Ladies and gentlemen, there are many actors already working to protect the rights of children in the EU. I say many, but I certainly also think not too many, because sadly, there is certainly more than enough to do for all of us and many more. If we are really here to do justice to all children, we have to stand hand in hand with them, but also, crucially, with each other. Listening, learning, sharing. Today, we are here not only for the children, but we are here truly with our children, and in particular, vulnerable children, those who have been through experiences that no one should have to go through, let alone as children, like suffering domestic violence or being trafficked. But also children with other vulnerabilities, with intellectual disabilities, separated, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. We are here to see how we can work together in order to increase the protection of the rights of vulnerable children. Each of us brings valuable experience, working towards the same goal but from different angles, as a legal practitioner or a child ombudsperson, as someone from a local authority, from an intergovernmental organization or a national government, or representing a national human rights institution or an equality body, but also as carers or working in a victim support organization or other NGOs. Ladies and gentlemen, the legal framework designed to protect the rights of children in the EU is stronger than ever. Yet the rights of children are still being violated in the European Union on a daily basis. We're all here today to ensure that we move from paper to practice, to ensure that we make the legal, these legal tools work for all children on the territory of the European Union, including the most vulnerable of them. But to do this, we need to join forces. Children get involved in justice systems, and their rights can be limited or overlooked. That is why we need a child-friendly justice for all children involved in court proceedings, be they victims, defendants, or witnesses. And we have to make sure that children have effective access to justice. That means that we have to look closely at the modes of their participation, the way they are represented, and also how they receive relevant information in an appropriate way. We also have to improve the services for children by training professionals that are dealing with children and by promoting the exchange of best practices. So much is underway in those last months, which will change tremendously the way we are thinking about justice and the way we are implementing justice. And of course, ensuring justice and protection for all children is part of this, because it is, first of all, part of the Charter. Article 24 of the Charter explicitly stipulates that all children have the right to protection and care as it is necessary for their well-being. It also requires that children can express their views freely and, most important, that such views shall be taken into consideration. Well, we started our uh, discussions today with children expressing their views and asking us to be taken seriously. It is written in the Charter. It doesn't come out of the blue. And it also says the Charter that in all actions relating to children, whether those actions be taken by public authorities or private institution, the child's best interest must be the primary consideration. Think of a courtroom with its dull furnishing, people dressed up in a funny way with wigs and gowns, and the very strict, incomprehensible, so very often, procedures, an intimidating atmosphere for very many adults, and certainly not an environment in which a child may feel comfortable, believed in, or even supported. Add to this the language used. Talk about habeas corpus, subpoenas, and a lot of other Latin words, which 
hardly any adults really understand, let alone children. Yet the reality is that today, hundreds and of thousands of children, young people, come into contact with the law before they turn 18. We are here to discuss how this concerns children who are questioned about their experience of domestic violence so that we can actually prosecute the perpetrators. Children, victims of trafficking, whose testimonies are needed for the police to track the traffickers. Unaccompanied minors who have fled their countries without their parents to seek protection in the EU and who are being interviewed by immigration authorities. Children with intellectual disabilities who have faced neglect or abuse in a residential institution instead of re receiving the care that they really needed. And the many other children who come into contact with Europe's justice system throughout the 27 member states. When these children come into contact with the authorities, sometimes they face grave violations of their rights. Some children do not receive appropriate medical care or decent education. Others do not have access to counseling and support services. Some are deprived of contact with their families and friends. Globally, the institutions of the Union are firmly committed to further strengthening the protection of particularly vulnerable persons such as children. And by proclaiming the promotion of children's rights as one of the European Union's fundamental aims, the Treaty of Lisbon has rightly so given a new impetus of, to the pursuit of protecting not just vulnerable children, but all children in Europe. And the Fundamental Rights Conference aims to stimulate this reflection both in content and methodology. Concerning the methodology, we may often go to great lengths to speak about children, but we could improve ways to hear them from them, either directly or indirectly through associations which represent their interests. I think, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, this conference also looks to another very important category of vulnerable children, particularly challenging in a multidisciplinary perspective, and we, I'm talking about the unaccompanied uh, minors, uh, the refugees and migrant, migrant young people staying in a foreign country without their parents or tutor. They form a target group that puts counselors and care workers for, from several organizations and public authorities before specific multi-purpose challenges once again. Detection of the phenomenon, identification of the people, protection are the most important challenges when dealing with these groups of young people. Child protection is an area where there is a wealth of international norms, standards, guidelines, including from the United Nations and the Council of Europe. We have much of the guidance we need to address child protection issues appropriately. This is more about how we move those guidance and guidelines into action. If we look at the glo challenges globally, we also know that the most grave violations are committed against children are elsewhere in developing countries, and we also need that context uh, to what we're talking about to today. At the same time, we also know that despite those global challenges, we still find immense challenges also in Europe. Because sadly, we know that many forms of child protection violations uh, still exist here in Europe. And some of the gravest ones, sexual exploitation, violence, the worst, the worst forms of child labor, trafficking, as well as other forms of violations, such as unjustified detention, separation from families, and the list goes on, and you are the experts in this area. I just want to reflect for a minute on who these vulnerable children are. And they are often the most marginalized of all. That's not to say that all victims are from the most marginalized communities. But coming from a marginalized population significantly adds to the risk and vulnerability of children and the likelihood that they may suffer protection violations. So we need to place whatever we do in a bigger context. What we do also needs to be nested in the EU's efforts to address vulnerability more broadly, such as under the EU 2020 strategy, 
addressing child poverty and promoting child well-being more generally. These EU efforts very much coincide with UNICEF's refocus around equity globally. In everything we do, the most disadvantaged children and those in greatest need must have priority.